Can I say amen to that? Our God is an amen. awesome God. We had a great week at campus last week. Um, um, I'm just giving uh, Faith and Grace a heads up. You're going to say something during our announcement time about, you don't have to come up here, about how great camp was. You can't tell about the parts where it went badly for you. But you can only talk about how great camp was. Let's stand together and sing Everlasting God's Great Rises. Wait on the Lord. Rises, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Thankful rises, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are. Tell me something, Vicky. Tell me something. You all work at camp this week. Good morning, Vicky Gun. <laughs> hurry up, hurry up. One of you say something. Um, I know there was at least one salvation this week at camp. That's pretty cool. Seven. Seven or seven? Four? Four? Seven decisions. Seven decisions for growth. Four salvations. Yeah, you weren't a counselor. You worked with all the games and activities, as did Faith, right? Faith, something else? Um, it was a little yeah. Games went well. They kind of got thrown in the end of annual week, but we got to figure it out. So it was, it was good. I think um, it worked out. It rained one time, so we couldn't play games, but it worked out because we needed to play that game at the end of the week. We got all the water we needed to get across, so it worked out really well. Yeah. 
They attempt a uh, hundred kids for a game with social distancing where if they touch something, you gotta clean it. <laughs> Figure out how to do that, they did that. Vicki? So there are opportunities for kids to still go to camp. There's a teen week this week, then there's another junior week, then there's another teen week. There's a family camp coming up at the end of the summer, and then there's a week off for people if you just want to camp there for the week. There won't be any food, there won't be any activities, but you can use the campground, you can camp there, you use one of the cabins. Contact Greg, there's exciting things happening at Lamoka. Now, big announcement, next week, where are we meeting? At the Miller's house on Seneca Road, up the road, I don't know. Just keep going until you find it. Keep going until you find it. <laughs> well, what? It's on the left. We'll put some balloons hopefully out on, the, out, on the, out on the road so you won't miss it. But it's out there. Now, here's what Don Anita texted me yesterday. They are going to host after the service a dish to pass dinner. So if you want to have a dish to pass dinner, they're going to have the beverages and I think tables and stuff there all set up. Bring your own table service and a dish to pass. If you want to stay for that, that's going to happen after the service. Service is at 10 o'clock. We'll be done around 11. And uh, she wanted to let you know that. S second or third thing. can't remember VBS now. VBS in three weeks. VBS in three weeks. As you can see, the station is almost done. The railroad tracks are here. There's going to be a train showing up pretty soon. We're excited about that. If you have a Christmas tree, undecorated Christmas tree, we want to put some pine trees on here. So if you have one, bring it any size, and you put it together. <laughs> Don't bring me a box without instructions. But if you want to bring one here, bring it over. I'll be here all week. Building will be unlocked. You could walk in here. You could put it together and just set it on the platform. Maybe put your name on it, you know, <laughs> so we know that it's your tree. But that would be great. That would be helpful. And third thing, on Wednesday, if you want to gather together with some other people to pray from 7 to 7.30 here, here on Wednesday night, 7 to 7.30, you can come. We're going to have maybe 10 minutes of a little devotional from the Word of God, and then we're just going to gather and pray in small groups. Maybe it's just you and one other person, and you'll figure out the amount of social distancing you need based on the person you're praying with. That's going to start on Wednesday night, 7 to 7.30, and we're excited about all that. Our call to worship is... There it is, Psalm 9, 1 and 2. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of your marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. That's what we've come here today to do, to praise the Lord and to hear from him. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we can gather again in this place. We thank you for the churches around New York State and across the country and around the world that are gathering today because this is the first day of the week and we set this aside to come together to fellowship, to hear from your word and to sing praises to you and we thank you for that. We pray that you continue to bless those who, who feel because of the present pandemic are, are unsure about gathering together because of the risks that they take and where their own life is. We pray you continue to bless them as they get to watch um, our services online and get blessed by that. We pray, Lord, that you'll continue to guide us each day, every day, every step of the way. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing a couple of the great hymns of faith. Come now, fount of every blessing. Come now, fount of every blessing. To my heart to sing my grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, calls for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the loud I'm fixed upon it, out of thy redeeming love. Oh, new grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Oh uh -huh. 
sounds like a Christian protest. <laughs> That's all. And we've been joking about that. You know, as Christian protesters, we can gather in large numbers and in close proximity to one another. But our scripture reading this morning is out of 1 Samuel chapter 15. It's verses 1 through 3, and then it's verses 7 to 9. I'm going to invite you to stand for our scripture reading. <coughs> Good morning. 1 Samuel 15, 1 through 3, 7 through 9. Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have, and do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. And Saul attacked the Am Amalekites from Havla all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalek, sorry, Am Amalek, oh well, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. This passage of scripture is probably one of the most controversial passages of scripture in talking about how can God be merciful and loving and forgiving and bring about such utter destruction, but it's a, it's a passage dealing with our willingness to obey God and to understand who God is over the long-term period of generation to generation. And the song we're going to sing just before the message talks about giving to God the, the due diligence of our attention when only he is worthy of our praise. Sing forever. 
may be seated. I want the kids to come up here for a few moments here, right over to this chair, if you would, kids. As I transition to talk to them for a few minutes, and parents, you might, uh, parents, guardians, grandparents, whoever has time with these kids, you may want to pay attention to this, because this is going to be your opportunity to figure out what they fear. <laughs> All right. I brought a little basket here. There's not enough for everybody to take, but have a seat. Make sure. Is there a place? Yeah, you can sit right there. Okay. Uh, yeah, come on up. So, what are some of the worst things you could do at home or in school? I'll let you answer a couple of questions, then we're going to do a drawing here. What is the worst thing you could do at home or in school? What is the one thing you do you get in the most trouble? What could you do and get in the most trouble? Fighting. Fighting. Excellent. What else? Attacking your sister, so that's like fighting. Anything else? Uh, like punching. We're still sticking with fighting. Okay, like punching. Man, I have like seven other ideas here, but we can go with fighting, punching. Anything else you could do that's really bad you'd get in trouble for? Stealing. It seems like Jared's got it all down here, guys. Apparently, Jared knows what all of you have been doing. He's been watching. He's like the guardian of truth, right? <laughs> so you could fight. You could steal. Anything else? You could break stuff. Okay, so here, um, you pull one card out of there. Now, I know you probably can't read yet completely. You pull one out. We're going to rank these. Here, you pull one out. There's a couple there, so just pull one of them. There we go. Here, you want to pull one of them out? All right, let's go down here. You want to pull one of them out? And you pull one out. Okay, now if you can read it, can you read it and tell me what it says if you can read it? If you can't read it, hold it toward me and I'll read it if you can't read it. Fighting, perfect one for you. <laughs> fighting. Stand up here, stand up here. You're going to hold the fighting card. What does yours say? Cheat. <laughs> stand up here. She's a cheat. Can you read that one? Steal. Come on up here, you little thief. Steal. What do you got? Lie. Get up here, liar. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Okay, what do you got? Talk back. Talk back. Do you even talk, Blaine? <laughs> talk back. And what do you got? What's that say? Say no. Come on up here. Say no. So here's the worst sins kids can do at home. They can hold it so I can read it. Fight, cheat, steal, lie. Talk back and say no. Which one's the worst? Lie? Talk. No, no. parents don't get to speak. <laughs> Which one do you think? Lie or talk back? Lie? Okay, so who's got lie? Come over here. You're first. You're the first worst sinner. Lie. Talk back. You're second. What do you think? You think fight's the next worst? Yeah, yeah. He knows fight's the worst. What do you got? Steal? You think steal's next? Okay, steal is next. Stand right there. What do you got? Cheat and say no. There we go. Bunch of wicked sinners. Now, you guys are all the sinners. You guys are the parents, you kids. What should we do to them for doing that? What's the best punishment you can give? How about timeout? Good punishment? Okay, what about a long talk? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I'm not saying to you, you would do it to them. You think mom should have a long talk with him? Yes, <laughs> okay, you know, a long talk. How about losing a privilege? We get to play outside, you have to sit in the house, right? That sound like a good fair thing? So now I've given your parents all understanding of what to do when you do those things. Here's one last thing, one last thing for all of you. Which one of these things could you do and get kicked out of the house forever? <laughs> if you lie, you're out of here. Go find another place to live. You're out of here. Now, fortunately, that really doesn't happen, right? We could say no. We could cheat. We could lie. We could hit. We could do all these things. Hopefully, mom and dad don't, like, kick you out. Like, out, out of here, buddy. I mean, you're pretty short. Nobody's going to see you if they kick you out. So today we're going to talk about Saul, the king, and he does a really bad thing, and let's see what God does to him. 
So um, I'll take all these cards back because I got another service and we'll destroy these. And uh, I got another set of them. All right, guys, you can go back and sit with your families. Thank you very much. Now, uh, now, kids, would that have been great if we brought your parents up here and identified their greatest sins? Yeah. yeah. And then we could identify what punishments they should get for committing those sins? Well, we're going to talk about your parents here in a few moments. Let me ask you this question. Are there lines, everyone, are there lines we can cross that you can't go back from? Is there a line you can cross that you can't go back from? In the criminal justice system, and in today's world, they're saying the criminal justice system isn't just. But in the criminal justice system, if you commit three particular crimes, it's called three strikes and you're out. You go to prison for life. That sounds like you can cross a line and there's no coming back from it. Um, I, was, I was looking up what happens to convicted felons. Do you know a convicted felon in most states cannot serve on a jury? They cannot apply for federal or state grants. They can't live in public housing. They can't get food stamps. And without a, puff, a, a pardon from the governor, they can't own a gun. In most states, those are the rules for convicted felons. It's not the same in every state, because we live in 50 different states, and they have their own rules. But there are lines you can cross in life that you, you can't come back from. I looked it up, and can convicted felons serve in Congress? And they said, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, a convicted felon can serve in Congress unless Congress kicks them out. But why would you kick out your own kind? But no, I'm just kidding about that. Um, are there sins in the Bible? Are there sins in the Bible for which you cannot be forgiven or you can't go back? I want to point out two of them this morning just briefly. We're not going to turn there, but Deuteronomy chapter 24 verses 1 through 4 says this. I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version. If you marry and divorce... And then the divorced woman marries someone else and divorces that person. They can't go back and marry the original husband. Deuteronomy 24, 1 to 4. So if a woman divorces her husband or the husband divorces the woman, she marries someone else and gets a second divorce, she can't go back to the original husband. They says there's adultery. I read a couple commentaries just to wrap my head around it. We're not going to go into it. I don't really understand it. But apparently in Deuteronomy 24, there was a line in Israel you could cross and you couldn't go back. Now, more importantly is this one. Matthew chapter 12, verses 31 and 32. These verses are going to come on the screen. First is verse 31. Notice what it says. Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. You can say anything you want or do anything you want and God can forgive it. Any sin, any blasphemy. Blasphemy means you're saying bad things about God. You say bad things about God. But if you say something bad, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, it won't be forgiven you. Go to the next verse, and I'll explain it here. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, who is the Son of Man? Jesus Christ. Anyone who says something against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. You can say the most horrible things about Jesus Christ. You could say he was a fraud. You could say he was an adulterer. You could say he had an illicit relationship with Mary Magdalene, and some say that. You could say he was a drunkard. You could say he was a deceiver. You could say anything you want against the Son of Man will be forgiven you. In the earlier verse, he says you could say anything about God, like God the Father. Well, God didn't create the universe. God didn't do this. God is unjust. God is this. But it says whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him. Do you know what he's doing here? Do you know what Jesus is teaching here? He says, look, a lot of people think they know about God and they don't believe in God. A lot of people have heard about Jesus and they say, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. If you know about the Holy Spirit, you actually know quite a bit about God and Jesus and the whole picture of the Bible. If you know enough about the Holy Spirit, you are now making an outward statement of rebellion against all that God is. He says, go ahead and say something bad about Jesus. Go ahead and deny creation. But don't you dare get to the point where the Holy Spirit, whom you've never seen, the Holy Spirit who works all the miracles, the Holy Spirit who's behind the scenes, don't you dare at the core of you, at the very core of your being, don't you dare say he's not God. It kind of says there's eventually a line you cross 
It's not the first line, right? It's not the second line. It may not be the hundredth line, but there is a line you cross that goes too far. That's the story of the Amalekites. The Amalekites have crossed the line. And God's going to destroy them. Saul is going to cross a second line. What is going to happen to him? Is Saul just starting out in his downward spiral of self-destruction? Nobody gets to a level where they commit suicide without having gone through a lot of stages of self-loathing. A lot of discouragement in their life. Nobody just jumps to the end. And Saul here is on a journey where he's rejecting God, he's walking away from God, and at what point will he go too far? In 1 Samuel 13, Saul has overstepped his bounds. Remember, he offered a sacrifice that he wasn't asked to do. He failed to wait. He was supposed to wait and do nothing. He failed to do that. He feared the men around him more than he feared God. He says, the people are abandoning me. I'm on my own. I must do this sacrifice. Most places, if you do that level of disobedience, you get fired, right? I mean, there are lines you can cross at work that if you cross that line, they're going to fire you, whether you're in a union or not. You can't cross that line. Sometimes we're amazed at what people, boundaries people will push. Here is Saul who has overstepped his bounds, but God is merciful and God is slow to anger. And he gives Saul a second chance. Notice 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1. Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Here is Saul who has blatantly disobeyed God, and Samuel comes to him and says, Look, God's anointed you. God's anointed you, Saul. I need to remind you of something. God chose you. Saul is supposed to never forget that God chose him. Do you take for granted? I don't know the background of every single person here, and your background as to who was the first one to tell you about God? Who was the first one to share the story of Jesus Christ? Who was the first one to tell you that the Bible has the answers for our life? I don't know that for your particular story, but do you ever take for granted that someone did? That someone told you? Maybe you were three or four years old and you were going to a church Sunday school or a vacation Bible school. You went to camp. Maybe you went to Camp Lamoke or another camp. Maybe your parents told you about that. They used to read Bible stories to you. Do we ever take for granted the people who told us about God? Here's what, here's what Samuel's saying to Saul. Don't take for granted, Saul, that God chose you. Of all the people in Israel, he chose you to be king. He anointed you to be king. He knew what you were going to be like, and he still chose you. Do you realize? No, no, some of you, okay, some of you are married. So at this moment, look at the person you married. Okay, just look at them. Jim, yeah, you can turn your whole head, Jim. All right, look at the person you married. Okay, now, the person who looked at you, they chose you. Maybe out of desperation. Maybe out of resignation. But they chose you. You are together in marriage. Children, look at your parents. Your parents chose you. At some moment of delusion, they said, let's have kids. And let's have another kid. And let's have grandkids. You know, because if you have kids, there's a chance you're going to have grandkids. And it's not even going to be your choice. You're just going to have them. We are chosen. We are in the situation we are because we were chosen. He says, don't forget that. You didn't initiate this. You know, you aren't in charge, but you are there. Saul's job was then to represent God. What do others see of God in us? Do people, when they look at us, do they see a believer in God? We believe in God. Or do they see a skeptic? Well, so you're talking to somebody and they go, well, I'm not sure. You're right. I'm not sure about this whole God thing. Are you a skeptic? Or are you a denier? Remember, remember Peter, on the night Jesus was arrested, three times he was a denier. He wasn't a skeptic, he was a denier. He was scared, he was fearful. Don't you think that crossed the line? Don't you think Peter crossed the line? 
Three years he's with the Lord, and in one night he denies him three times. And what does Jesus do? He forgives him. So Peter could become a denier. Sometimes we're a denier, right? Sometimes you're in a conversation with someone, and something comes up about a religion, and you go, I, I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to say anything about this. I'm not going to say what my opinion is. I'm not going to talk about my faith. Maybe you're in a conversation sometime with someone on, on God versus science, and, and this person is very well informed about science, and you're going, yeah, that sounds reasonable, when in your heart you're going, no, God did it all, that's not reasonable, but you're a skeptic in front of people. Saul's been given an opportunity to represent God, and he's responsible to obey God. He's supposed to. When Saul obeys God, he shows to the world that God is serious, that God is worthy, that God is real. When we obey the word of God, we are telling people, the Bible tells me I shouldn't do that behavior because I believe God is real. And I believe he's worthy to tell me what I can and can't do. Who are we going to follow? Saul is supposed to lead Israel in God's plans. You know, sometimes we complain because we don't know specifically what God has planned for us, right? You know, if only God would tell me exactly what's in front of me, I would be obedient to that, right? As long as God would just lay it out for me, he told me what I'm going to face, then I know what to do. Saul is given the perfect opportunity to know in advance what God is going to do, and how well does he do? Notice what happens. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 2 and 3. God has a plan for Saul. Notice what it says. Thus the Lord of hosts says to Saul, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. He has a plan. See, God never forgets. In Exodus chapter 17, Exodus chapter 17, verses 8 to 16, the nation of Israel is traveling through the wilderness. They come near Amalek. Amalek comes up behind him and attacks him from behind. It is the scene in the Bible where Moses goes up on top of the mountain, and as long as he holds the staff up, they win the battle. And his arms get tired. So Aaron goes up and Hur go up, and they set him on a stone to sit, and they hold the staff up so they win the battle. At the end of the battle, here's what God says. I am going to punish Amalek for their treachery. He makes a promise in Exodus chapter 17. Now what you need to understand is hundreds of years have gone by. God has given Amalek hundreds of years to correct their behavior. This is where people miss this part of the story. Amalek attacked Israel hundreds of years earlier. This is before the time of Joshua, before the time of the judges. Hundreds of years have gone by. They have been able as a nation to see what God is doing for Israel in the, nation, the land of Canaan. How God has been their God. How God has protected them. How God has punished them when they were wrong. How God has brought them back. They've been able to watch all of that, and still they've not turned to God in any way. And God says, you've had centuries of bad behavior as a culture. Sometimes God condemns the whole culture. The whole culture. America's only 250 years old. How bad is our culture getting? Well, not as bad as 1936 Nazi Germany. We're not as bad as 1936 Nazi Germany. I'm watching this show, Hunting Nazi Treasure. I don't know if any of you have seen that. The Nazis stole gold and paintings, and I'm watching this show where they're trying to find all this stuff. All the stuff the Nazis stole. They stole it from everybody. They stole it from museums. They stole it from people's houses. They just stole and stole and stole. They were rotten people. A group of very, very rotten people. And one of the guys who was part of the stealing of gold went to Chile, where our missionaries to Sphinx are, and he lived there until he was 94. He lived to be 94. And they had a video of his burial. He died at 94. He was a war criminal who never got caught. They buried him in a coffin, and two guys standing above the coffin gave the Nazi salute as they lowered his casket into the ground. I mean, there are just some people and some cultures that are just sinful. And God says about Amalek, your time is up. I'm going to destroy you. And he tells Saul, you're going to be the instrument. You're the one doing it. Now, you can either be Saul willing or you can be unwilling, but you're going to do it. So Saul is supposed to utterly destroy them. 
There's to be no descendants, no spoil, and no memory. This is supposed to be a nation that nobody remembers. A group of people that is totally forgotten. It is interesting, is it not, in our culture right now, we are trying to erase history. Right? We're trying to erase history. God is all about sometimes erasing the history of wickedness. But then he also writes the stories in the book. And he says, don't forget, there was a group of people who were so wicked that I destroyed them all, called Sodom and Gomorrah, called the Egyptian army and Pharaoh, called the Amalekites. They're going to be people who are so wicked. And then when you get to the book of Revelation, he says there's going to be people in the future who are so wicked, who are so rebellious, who are so rejecting of God that I'm going to destroy them. And here's what he says. So what does Saul do? He partially obeys. <sighs> Parents. Grandparents, if your grandchild or your child partially obeys, is that obedience? Is partial obedience obedience? Here's what it says, chapter 15, verse 7. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. Saul gathered an army of 210,000 soldiers. He warned the Kenites, who were an innocent group. He says, stay away from here because I'm going to destroy the Amalekites. Stay away. And then he attacks Amalek. So how does he do? Verse 8. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. He destroyed all the people. Now think about this. He destroyed the men, the women, the children, the infants. He killed them all, just like he was told, except the king. Now look at verse 9. But Saul and the people, so together they decided to spare Agag and the best of the sheep, the best of the oxen, the best of the fatlings, the best of the lambs, and all that was good. But everything that was despised, everything that was worthless, they destroyed. So they killed all the people but one. They destroyed all of the animals but the best. Partial obedience, but what does God want? Chapter 15, verse 11. Here's what God says to Saul through Samuel. I greatly regret that I've set Saul as king. For he has turned his back from following me and has not performed my commandments. What does God, there's five things God wants from us that comes out of the end of this chapter. There's five things God wants from us. Here's the, here's the truth of it all. We are all going to sin. We're all going to sin. Maybe not the exact sin of Saul. None of us, I think, have been told to destroy a nation of people and to kill all the people. But there are things God has actually commanded us to do, behaviors we're supposed to have. We're going to fail. We're going to sin. We're going to sin because we're ignorant. We're going to sin because we're rebellious. What does God want? Well, the first thing he wants out of Saul is to be a faithful follower. He wants him to be a faithful follower. He says, look, I'm going to give you a path. Just go down the path. Just walk down the path. Just, just, just adjust. Uh, camp this week, those who were working at camp, did, you, did the schedule get adjusted occasionally? Did the activities get adjusted occasionally? I mean, you watched Greg flying around that camp, particularly early in the week, wondering if it was working. Never done this before. Welcoming the kids in, having them picked up at the end of the day, how many rows of cars, where they're using microphones to call kids over, changing every, there was, Vicki just told me there's a new schedule for senior week that is version D, version D. So the week hasn't started yet. We're already at version D. I'm assuming there was A, B, and C. And maybe by the end of the week, there'll be E and F. But here's what we ask of the staff at Lamoka. Follow Greg. Somebody's got to make the decisions and make the calls. Just follow. So when he gets on his phone or he gets on the radio, he says, hey, Gracie, I need you to go do this. You know, you guys made water balloons for how many hours? Six hours they made water balloons, and then the storm rolled in, they didn't get to use them. They sat for six hours and made water balloons. I, I can't do that. I got, an, I, got a, I, got a, I got an attention span of about four minutes, and then I need something else. God wants a faithful follower. Following is not sometimes. You don't get to choose the when and the how. Well, God, I'll follow you if... You either follow or you don't. Verse 12 of chapter 15 says this. Saul went to Carmel, and indeed, he set up a monument for himself. Here's what God wants from us. He wants first place, and there's no second place. 
We gave away a dinosaur this week at camp. For all the kids who learned all the verses, and they had like a lot of verses every day. If they learned all the verses for the week, they got into a drawing. And there was like seven kids at the end of the week of the 90 to 100 kids. Seven of them said all the verses. And then we had a drawing. And they gave me each a little cloth bag. And if it had candy in it, that was a reward. If it had a coin in it, they got the dinosaur, the stuffed dinosaur. One winner, no second. No second place. God says you either follow me or you don't. You can't just partially follow me. You can't just follow me when it's convenient. You can't just follow me when I'm going the direction you want to go. Saul here makes himself the absolute ruler. He sets up a monument for himself. He made himself the center of attention. So either God is the creator of the universe or it's evolution. It can't be both. I spent all week teaching that to the kids. Either God is the creator or it all evolved on its own. It's not both. Either there are absolutes that the Bible teaches, absolute standards of morality and ethics, or it's everyone does what's right in their own eyes. Majority rules, stronger rules, court rules. It's either absolutes or it's not absolutes. You can't have both. Well, there's some absolutes and there's no. There's either absolutes or not. They're not, they're not, you can't define them. You can't nuance them. Here's a question for you. When we say glory to God, oh, let glory be to God, is that true? Do we really truly want glory to go to God, or is it just a phrase we say so we sound spiritual? Praise God. Is that a phrase we use as Christians that sounds spiritual, or is it real? Is it true? Because can we say praise God when our, I, I was telling the, the staff on Thursday, or Wednesday night or Thursday night, I says, what happens when the day goes sideways? You know what I mean when the day goes sideways? You're planning to go down this path, and all of a sudden it goes, Poof. can you still praise God when it goes sideways? Can you still praise God when it all turns upside down and doesn't happen the way you wanted it to? So two things that God wants. He wants us to be a faithful follower, and he wants to be first place. Here's the third thing he wants. It's found in verse 13. Here's what Saul says to Samuel. Blessed are you of the Lord, Samuel. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. That's what he says to Samuel. What does God want from us? He wants honesty. I mean, as Samuel is looking at King Agag, who's standing there, Samuel's going, what? What's this? Blessed are you, Samuel. I did exactly what God said. What? You ever seen the kid who's got chocolate on his face? And he swears he didn't take the chocolate? I didn't take any chocolate. Vicky tells me about a story with your sister, Debbie. Debbie could have all of the evidence of the world on her, and she would say, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. The broken lamp is in your hand. I don't know how this broke. The blood is coming out of your brother's head. I do not know how this lamp broke. My brother must have jumped into it, and I picked up the wreckage. Here's Saul. The evidence is sitting in front of him that he did not kill everyone. And he goes, blessed are you, I'm a wonderful person. He declares his obedience. In verse 15, he blames the people. Look at verse 15, he says this. In verse 15, and Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. He's talking about the animals. For the people spared the best of the sheep, the oxen, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Saul's already moved away from the Lord, his God, to the Lord your God. See, what I think Saul has done is he's interpreted God's command about killing everything to mean you're not allowed to have any spoil. You can't have the animals for yourself, but you can have the animals in order to gain credit. To gain credit. It's kind of like this with us. Okay, so we're in the middle of this raising money for our building project, right? We have about $36,000, $37,000. Project's going to cost about two hundred and sixteen. dollars between 216 and 225. So we need to raise a little more money. So I keep reading in the news that we're going to get another stimulus check, right? We're all going to get another stimulus check, probably. I, I can't imagine the government is not going to send us more money. They probably are. Now, eventually, Elijah's going to pay it back. 
for us. He's going to work the next 85 years, and he's going to pay the taxes to pay back all the money we're going to get. But now here in your mind, here's a deal you could make with God. God, give me a big stimulus check, and I'm going to give 50% of it to the building fund. God, you give me that big stimulus check. You give me that $2,000, and I'll put 1000 in the offering plate. That's kind of like saying, God, I want the credit for giving to the building fund, but you give me the money above and beyond what I have now so I can give it. That's basically what Saul's doing here. There's a chance to have these amazing sacrifices to God, and they'll all look at, look at Saul. He's such a wonderful spiritual leader. Look at these sacrifices. He has a chance to take all of that bounty and give it to God and look really generous when it never was his. God had already said, destroy it all and give it to me in destruction. Don't give it in sacrifice and make a big deal. Last two points of what God wants from us. The next one is found in verse 19. God's not afraid to call us out, right? Listen to what Samuel says, verse 19. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? Why did you do this? What does God want? When he calls us out in our sin, what does he want? He wants repentance. He wants us to admit. Saul could have went, oh, you got me. You caught me. Some kids are wired that way, right? As soon as you confront them, they go, I'm so sorry. I know I did it. Other kids, it's like, how dare you even think that I could do something wrong? You know it's not in my DNA. Now, it's in dad's, but it's not in mine. See, because I'm, I'm your good child. If you have multiple kids, you ever have a kid say, I'm the good child? I'm your best child. I'm the child you most love because I'm most worthy of love. Here's what God wants. Admit you're a sinner, especially when it's blatantly in front of everybody. Just say, I messed up. I, I kept thinking how great it would be to take all these animals and make this great, splendid, wonderful demonstration to you, God, of sacrifice, I messed up. I thought you would be pleased with that. Just like in the last sin, right? You know, Samuel, I thought God would be pleased if I did the sacrifice since you weren't here and we had to go to war. I just, I messed up. But he doesn't. He doesn't accept the responsibility. In verse 20, we read that already. He says, I've obeyed. Is Saul going to continue in his rebellion? Look at verse 23. Verse 23 says this. Here's what, this is the most telling verse that's going to outline the rest of Saul's life. Verse 23, chapter 15. So Samuel says this to him. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Witchcraft is going to come to play in Saul's life. Stubbornness is as an iniquity and idolatry. You've rejected the word of the Lord. He says, you have been like a witch. You have been stubborn and you have been idolatrous. He uses the strongest words that in the Old Testament law were the things God condemned above all else and you sacrificed your life for. If you were an idolater, you could be killed. If you practice witchcraft, you could be killed. If you would not repent of your sin, you could be killed. And in one verse... Samuel says, Saul, you're on the line with your stubbornness, your idolatry, and your witchcraft. This is not a case where you misinterpreted. This is not a case where you are heading down a road that you might not recover from. So what does Saul say? Verse 15, chapter 15, verse 24. I have sinned because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Sounds like he's repenting, but he's not. He's saying, I have this flaw in me. I'm afraid of people. But he's not afraid of God. What was the other rule? God's first, there's no second place. You can't say, well, I'll fear God unless the people are more scary. I'll fear God unless my circumstances become more desperate. I'll fear God unless, no, it's I'll fear God. And he says, I fear the people. So in verse 28, Samuel says to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today. 
In the first sin, what did he say? Your family will not stay on the throne. Jonathan will not become king. Now he says, you've lost it. I'm pulling it out. I'm taking it away. I'm taking it away and I'm giving it to somebody else. That somebody else is going to be chosen right away. That somebody else, David, is not going to be ready to be king. So Saul's going to stay on the throne, but God's saying, I've taken it from you. When he tells them that, God says to him, here's what I want. I want from you, Saul, selfless commitment to me. And here's what he says in verse 30, the most tragic verse, I think, in the life of Saul. He says, I have sinned, yet honor me now. He says, before the elders of the people, before Israel, return with me that I may worship the Lord your God. He says, look, okay, I've messed up, but I need you to put on a good front for me in front of the people. I still, I'm a politician. I st Are you at some times sick and tired of the culture in which we live where people could do terrible, horrible things and they say, oh, but I get a do-over? What, you know, 30 years ago, if a politician did some of the things that politicians do today, they're out of office, they're, they're shamed, and you never hear from them again. Now it's like, oh, sorry. I, it just shows you I'm a flawed person. There's like no line that can be crossed today. That people can't just come back and just live. That's Saul. Says, okay, I'll admit I've sinned, but... Samuel, you got to go with me and make it look in front of the people that we're all okay. It's all okay. It's all okay. Don't worry about it. We'll just keep that between the two of us that that's going on back there. You know, you hear about this all the time in our world still. People of noteworthy uprightness, you then find out there's all of this horrible stuff in the background that dozens of people knew about, and they just let it go. Saul fails again. Fails repeatedly, and in our next message, we're going to see how he spirals completely out of control, and God says, enough. What's the encouragement out of this? You go, man, what a depressing, what a depressing passage of Scripture. The Amalekites all die because the generations of wickedness. Saul messes up, and he's going to lose his kingdom. He's going to eventually lose his life. What is there to gain from this? Here's what to gain from this. God, in his mercy, has not yet killed you and me. And we are not that great a people. We have moments, maybe not every day, but I would suggest every week, we have moments when we are a selfish, terrible person, angry or bitter or miserable or complaining, and God says, okay, I know, I'm going to keep working with you. Let's come back. Let's show a little compassion. Let's... You know, at, at camp, the schedule changing and changing and changing, I caught on early on that it was going to shift around a bit, and Greg comes over to me. I don't remember what day. It might have been Wednesday, and he comes over to me. I've got all my stuff set up under the pump house there where I'm going to do the teaching. And I'm just sitting there in a chair waiting. He says, ah, oh, we've got to change the schedule. I says, okay. He says, we're going we're gonna to start at like 15 minutes early. Okay. And, and I don't know if he was fearful. I was going to, at one point I says, no, we can't do that. I have 15 more minutes to sit here. We can't start. No, I wasn't going to give him a hard time because he was like stressing that he had to go to another person and say, I got to change things. Are you okay? And I went, absolutely. And then later in the day, he says, we're going to change when the evening chapel is. Okay. We're going to do it earlier because I want the kids to have a bigger break. Okay. Absolutely. I go up there earlier. Kids come late. <laughs> <laughs> Best laid plans. Just kind of, you know. Your day's going to be like that. Your week's going to be like that. Your life is going to be like that. Where you are going to be tempted to get angry and bitter and, and, and resentful. And God says, it's okay. Come back to me. Turn away from that weakness, that sin, and we can go on together. Dear Father, we thank you, Lord, that even when we read these kind of passages of Scripture that are in some ways so discouraging and so negative, we realize that you are so merciful and gracious to us that you offer us opportunity after opportunity to follow you, to believe you, to return to you, to become more faithful to you. We thank you for that, Lord. Help us to be 
honest with ourselves where we are today so we can approach you in a way where you can bless us, forgive us, touch our lives in a meaningful way to shape us to be like your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. In this time of desperation When all we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation We believe We believe broken generation when all this dark you help us see there is only one salvation we believe we believe we believe in God the Father we believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. We believe. So let our faith be more than anthems, greater than the songs we sing. And in our weakness and temptations, we believe, we believe.
question and prayer, please.